had the pleasure to announce again my friend and co-host of the Virtual Jug Book Reading Club, Roberto Cortez, for his second session at JPRIME 2017. My favorite topic, Java 7, 7 meets another, my, another of my favorite topics, Java 8. I don't need the mic. Oh. <laughs> uh, thank you, Ivan, for the introduction. Um, welcome, everyone. Thank you so much for attending this session. Uh, I hope that you guys have an awesome break and had some coffee and some cookies. Um, so today, uh, the topic I'm bringing you is uh, Java 7 meets Java 8. So it's mostly around uh, some tips that I came up with to improve our Java 7 code with uh, Java 8 new code. Um, if you allow me, let me introduce a little bit about myself. As Ivan to uh, said to you, I'm Roberto Cortez. I'm mostly a passionate developer uh, that works in the software industry for like over 10 years. I've been mostly wor working on Java E stuff for the last seven or eight, uh, working and developing applications um, on the finance, health, and government sector. Uh, but over the last couple of years, I actually uh, switched fences and instead of actually actually developing the apps, I'm actually developing a server right now that runs Java E uh, that's called uh, Apache Tommy. Uh, and I work for this company that's behind the Apache Tommy um, web server, which is called Tommy Tribe. Other than that, uh, here are my uh, contacts. So you can reach me on Twitter, uh, my blog, uh, YouTube channel. I usually some, try to post some videos there of me doing some coding and my email, so feel free to uh, reach me on any of those. Um, regarding questions, so please feel free to interrupt me uh, anytime you want to uh, ask any question. Uh, just raise your hand, uh, call me. I, I do have like this bright light on top of me, so I'm not able to see you guys very well, but please try to call my attention in any way, and I'll be happy to answer the, uh, your question. Uh, right at that, at that minute. You'll still have a Q&A at the end if you want to ask it at the end, but uh, I just find it easier if you just ask them right away. Okay, so for our agenda for today, uh, we're gonna have a quick look on the SE and uh, Standard Edition and Enterprise Edition Java overview. Uh, and then the most interesting thing, so the slides are just, I only have here a couple of slides, like seven or eight, not just a couple, but seven or eight. And uh, most of the session will be uh, showing samples and trying to do a, a little bit of live coding. Uh, so mostly displaying code and that's it. So for, for the code demos that I propose to introduce to you here, uh, we're gonna look a little bit uh, into JPA and uh, how we can uh, integrate it with uh, the new daytime API, use some optionals and use some streams as well. Uh, the, everyone's favorite uh, implementation, JAX-RS, or uh, SPEC, uh, with a little bit of optional and completable feature. Uh, some web sockets with streams and collections enhancements that came in with, uh, with Java 8 APIs. Um, then a couple of other, uh, not much used to specs, but still interesting, like timers, concurrency, uh, to use method references. And finally, a little bit about uh, batch. Um, then I also have a couple of other future ideas that quite don't work yet, but uh, there might be some ideas to improve the platform uh, so we can use more of the Java 8 features with the Java E stuff. So a little bit of overview uh, of SE and E. Uh, as you can see with this uh, graph over here, uh, usually you have uh, when, you, when an SE version comes out, uh, or when a E version comes out, they usually target a, a specific uh, SE version. So usually there is an alignment between uh, SE and EE version. Uh, if they've been pretty much aligned, like when you, when you have an SE version coming up, then there is an a E version coming up for that SE version. Unless when you see like that little gap over there, can anyone guess what's happening on that timeline? Well, that's when uh, Oracle bought Sun. So there was like this delay uh, with the EE and the SE versions. Um, now things are catching up again, and then you'll see that uh, uh, Java E7 actually was targeted SE7. So when we got SE8, there is no Java E8 yet, uh, but that doesn't mean that we are not able to use uh, SE stuff or the E8 or the SE8 stuff with the E7 stuff. 
so this is just a summary uh, what I'm talking about. Uh, let's move on. Um, regarding the application server, so uh, at the moment, uh, application servers that are uh, running on E, uh, we have Glassfish, Wildfly, Tommy, uh, WebLogic, WebFear, Payara, a few other more. All of these already support Java C 8. So there is really no reason for us to not leverage some of the features that we have on SC8 with our Java E7 stuff. Uh, so you'll definitely be free to use it because most of the application servers already support it. Um, so just like to have like quick raise of hands, who's here using uh, Java E? So yeah, most, most of you guys. Uh, and are you, still, are you guys using E7? Yeah, just a couple then. Uh, E6, a few more, E5. No, that doesn't, doesn't match. I'm, don't tell me you're using uh, Java 2E. Yeah, one guy over here. Sorry, let's, let's uh, make a minute of silence for these gentlemen over here. <laughs> I'll use all of them, okay. Then it, that's not so bad. I hope that you're using all of them because you're migrating stuff. Okay. Um, okay, moving on. Uh, so what do we have with uh, SE8? So the major features that you get the, from the, the SC8 implementation is, of course, lambdas and method references, uh, the streams API, which is a very powerful API uh, that provides collection enhancements, and you're able to like stream uh, your collections to append multiple methods. The new date and time API, so this is probably like the first implementation of a date time on the Java platform. Let's see if they got it right this time. I think they did. Um, and then a couple of other things like the optional, some string joiner, completable feature, some comparators, and like small, small features, but really interesting as well. Um, okay, so that kind of ends the slides I was going to show you, and we're going to go straight to the, some of the demos. Um, everything I'm going to show here is on this GitHub uh, repo. Uh, so you feel free to fork the code if you want to, if you have any ideas uh, um, that are missing here and you probably you have, feel free to contribute stuff. I'll be happy to uh, merge your code with mine. Okay, so let's go to the IDE. Uh, 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 okay. One. Okay, can you guys see the code? Okay, awesome. So let's start with uh, some of uh, uh, JPA stuff. Uh, no, this one. Okay. So this is just a simple bean. Um, you maybe you're probably recognizing some of this code. We probably wrote it. Uh, many times as well. Uh, so basically, when you try to do an entity manager dot find, uh, can anyone tell me what dot, dot find returns if it doesn't find uh, the object? Sorry? No. no. Yeah. So and whoever who doesn't get a null pointer exception because of that? Check for that. Yeah. Check for that. Well, my alternative actually is to um, wrap these methods in an optional. So optional is uh, one of the new APIs that um, Java 8 introduces, which basically allows you to wrap something that might, might or may not be null uh, into another object, which is optional. And then you're able to ha call a couple of methods on top of the optional to actually make sure that the, uh, to retrieve the object if it's not null or do something else if the object is not null. So to see an uh, example of how this could work, also, these, these, um, all these samples have tests as well. Uh, so this one is on JPA, find, find test. Basically, you'll do, you'll try to find a movie, I'll try to find a movie with a, a ID one. Um, assert it, it's there. If I try to find it with a, a five, then isn't usually you have to do something to some code like this. The, the, the object is not there, so if, if, if it's there, I'll print the object. If it's not, I'll, I'll just do a not found. 
Uh, but it was optional, I can do something like this, which is uh, more interesting, which is I'll just do a fine, I'll get an optional over there, and then with my optional, I have it here on the, on the print line, but I'll just write it again. I'll just do a uh, movie optional, uh, I can do a map, so basically all these methods are gonna be chained on optional and they'll be called if uh, the object actually is there, and if it's not, I'll, I can do something in the end. So I can do a map, and map actually is gonna do is, I'll do, I do a lambda over here, so I'll get the movie from the optional, and then I'll get movie, for instance, get name. This can actually be converted to a, to a method reference, and if the uh, movie is not there, then I can call another method call or else, and then I can put whatever thing I want over here, movie not found. So it's something that uh, seems pretty simple, but I think it's uh, um, uh, something cool to use. I, I use it a lot now to, to, to do these kind of methods. So at least shields me a little bit with no pointer exception, and it has the added advantage of me to actually convert other objects on this. And I'll show a couple of things uh, later when combining these with REST endpoints as well. So continuing with the, uh, I was showing, uh, where's the movie beam? Okay, so the same thing when, you, when you're doing a, 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 sta a, a select statement directly with a, with a query, and these usually actually returns a no result exception. So in here you can also do the same You'll just uh, do an optional of the entire statement, and if you caught like a non-result exception, you can just return an optional dot empty. That means that uh, uh, the optional doesn't have a value over there, and then you can do all the things like uh, map or else, and so on. Now, the the the, um, the interesting thing is that when you have this, then you can combine it with other methods as well. So. Let's just say that you want to delete a movie. So usually the code that you will write will be something like, like this. So public void delete movie two. I already have a, a movie ID over there. There oh is yeah. a question. Could you scroll up a little bit? Sorry? Could you scroll up a little bit? Oh, scroll up? Oh, okay, sorry. Yeah. I, that's strange. I, I was seeing it in my screen. Doesn't, okay. So I do a delete movie over here, and basically usually I'll have to do an entity manager dot find first to make sure that uh, I'm trying, I'm not gonna delete something that's not on the database. Uh, so this is like a, a, a movie dot class, and I pass an ID, and I take a bar over there, then I'll do uh, movie null, and then I'll do entity manager and dot remove movie. So it's kind of like a pain to do this, right? Um, with this style, then you can actually call, of course I could still have the method to do this, but uh, when you have the option over there on this uh, method on, on top, you could combine them and then I'll, you'll just call the find movie with query enhanced, and then you have this if present uh, method that you can follow on the optional, and basically you can pass a method reference or a lambda over here and do something on that, on that particular object. So what actually I'm doing is I'm passing a method reference of the entity manager dot remove, uh, so I can remove the object on the optional if it's there. So basically this, this little bit of code is the, the same as here. But I do believe that this one is a little bit nicer. Do you guys agree? No? Find it useful? Yes? No? Cool. Okay, so moving on. Um, I'm showing a little uh, now uh, conversion on uh, local date and local date time. So local date and local date time are part of the new API for the dates that were introduced in Java 8. Uh, JPA doesn't really support these data types, but that doesn't mean that we cannot use them with Java 7, especially because Java 7 introduced something called um, uh, the column converter or the entity converter, which allow you to map uh, whatever object you want on, on an entity. So here I have a, a person object, uh, which is annotated with an entity. And you can see here I have a local date and a local date time. Um, so how I'm able to do this is I'll just 
have this converter um, class, which implements attribute converter. So actually, um, you're able to get a, a, a SQL timestamp from the local date. So basically, that's how you're going to do it, to store the local date on the database. So this attribute converter implements two methods, convert to database column and convert to entity attribute. So basically, it's to do conversion between uh, you store it on database or retrieve it back to construct your object again. And here, what I'm going to do is I'll just going to, uh, when I have a local date, I'll just uh, going to use optional again because it might be null on my entity. Um, then I'm going to map it to the timestamp value of the local date. Uh, and if, if I don't find anything over there, I'll just uh, save null. The same thing to convert to an attribute. So I'll just retrieve the data from the, from the database as a timestamp. And then timestamp also actually have a method that allows you to retrieve uh, the local date time right away. But since timestamp uh, has the, the time portion and for the local date, I only want the, local, the, the date itself, I'll just do a two local dates later so I get rid of the, of the time uh, part. So if you look into the local date time converter, exactly the same, uh, but it doesn't get rid of the, of the time portion. Um, why, why is this useful? I'll, I'll let you guys know why. Does anyone have a, a requirement where you have to calculate um, the birthday or how many years a person is? or, well, you have a, a few of them. Do you know how to do that in Java pre-local date and pre-local date time in a proper way? Well, I'll show you. So, this is how you will calculate how old the person is with uh, before Java 8. And you might be thinking that you probably will be able to uh, uh, make this code simpler, but actually it's not, because um, the way, so the date itself has a lot of deprecated methods, and uh, usually you, you know, before Java 8, you use the calendar, and when you do a calendar get instance, you actually get the, 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 the time portion, um, then you try to reset it like this, to set the, the, the time, but the interesting enough is that the milliseconds are still there, even if you reset it like that. And so you have to call set milliseconds to zero to reset them. And then you have to grab the years, try to see uh, the difference between the years, and then go to the months and get to go to the days to make sure that you actually got the, 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 the age of the person right. So the suggestion, of course, is to use the local date and local date time because those are um, easier to work with. So if I want to calculate the same with Java 8, I will just write this single line of code. So I'll just do person get birth date until now, and I want it in years, and it will tell me the, the, the answer right away. So uh, I think now that um, it's easier if we work with local dates and local date times, and here's a way that you can use them on your Java e apps with uh, um, the Java E7 even without JPA supporting them. Useful? Yes? No? Okay. Finally, without, with JPA, um, I have this Criteria API. So who here loves the Criteria API? One person. You deserve a round of applause, sir, because that's the most horrible API I've ever seen. Who agrees with that? <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I'm, I'm going to try to make it a little bit better. <laughs> not, not, not like much better, but a little bit better. So when you're doing the, the criteria builder uh, with using the, the criteria API, basically you write something like this, right? Uh, so when, if you try to do it with, uh, with some queries, and basically uh, the idea to use the criteria API is when you have like a dynamic query where you don't know uh, everything that you want to search for, so you have to like append um, the search criteria on the query. So if you use the, the JQL uh, style of way, you have to do something like this, which doesn't really, uh, who here recognize stuff like that, that you have done like, don't, don't, don't be shy, you can tell that you've done it, no one's gonna judge you. 
Um, if you use the Cartier Build, it's a little bit better because it's a programmatic way, then you can just append it to the predicate, so you just, uh, well, you just have to write all these boilerplate code, which is a pain. Um, so with streams, I'm able to do it a little bit better, I think. So what I'm gonna do here is, um, yeah, I, I, sorry, I'm not, I'm not able to get rid of the boilerplate code, so uh, probably I'll just extract that to a method, but um, so in here what I'm gonna do is, uh, on, these, on these fine vehicles enhanced, when I have a criteria search and I'm, doing, I'm trying to do a criteria search over the type, I'm gonna pass in an optional because I don't know if I'm gonna use that criteria or not. And basically that allows me to then stream uh, my method parameters into the where clause. So then I can do something like, I do a stream of a simple entry of vehicle type. So in here I'm using the metadata information of the entities uh, to append the type. And then of course I can do like a, a dot filter on, the, on that optional, uh, and if the value is there, then I'll, I'll map it uh, to the JPA criteria builder and I'll do the, 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 the query over there, like builder.equals vehicle get key, whatever, and finally I'll just convert it to an array. So the, the, the idea here with this is that in here I'm just using one, but I'm able to pass in a stream, a collection, or whatever, and then I'm, able, I'm easily able to convert it to, to a, a list of predicates that I can pass into my criteria builder. So it's not, doesn't make it much better, I think it makes it a little bit simple to work with. Uh, finally, uh, still with JPA, this is not like a, a super, um, like a super feature, it doesn't, it doesn't even get it supported right now, but with repeatable annotations, so one of the things that uh, um, Java E does is when you try, when you want to have multiple annotations of the same, Java, Java 7 didn't support that, so basically they will have to create like a wrapper annotation, and then this wrapper annotation will take a, an array of other annotations, which kind of like makes your entities super big with all these uh, boilerplate code. Uh, now with Java 8, you're able to support multiple annotations at the same time, uh, with the same uh, qualified name at least. So instead of having something like this, then this can be converted to something like this. So just instead of having like this wrapper over here, uh, you can just uh, call this annotation multiple times and define uh, the name it queries uh, like that. Uh, but as I said, this doesn't work at the moment because the, the Java E implementation doesn't, uh, didn't implement it this way, but maybe on the next few versions they are able to uh, rework this a little bit and support this style of uh, annotations now. Okay, so we're done with JPA. Any questions so far? So let's look into, let's see, JaxRS, okay. JaxRS is uh, an awesome spec. Who here loves JaxRS? A few people, only three, four, five? Come on, don't be shy. Okay, now more. Um, for JaxRS, okay, let's see what, what we have over here. So JaxRS, I have here uh, like a simple uh, REST endpoint. Um, so I have a REST endpoint that does a find address. Uh, I have a notation called context, grabs stuff from, from my query parameters. Um, some people will probably put the query curve parameters directly on the method call, but usually that's not very practical if you have many of them. So it's usually better to use the UI info, just have one. Then you can just call the get query parameters, get first, so this will be the, 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 the old way of doing that. Um, my idea is to actually uh, rework this a little bit and uh, also use optional when you're grabbing the, um, the query parameter because you don't know if that's gonna be null or not. And then you're able to uh, use it directly into the stream API when you're doing some search. So if you're looking over here, if I have a collection and you want to search stuff on that, usually what you will do is you iterate on all the elements of the collection, uh, then you'll just do some, uh, a couple of ifs to check uh, properties on the elements that are on the collections, and if they match your criteria, then you return uh, whatever object you find. Um, in here with the optional, 
uh, I mean, the, 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 um, the amount of code is most of the same. I just find it a little bit cleaner to do it this way, especially because it's super easy to come over here and then if I want to have a new query parameter, I'll just duplicate the code and then I'll just do, uh, add a new line over here and then I'll just change whatever. So it's, I found, it, I found this little piece of code more maintainable than the one um, uh, up here. Um, the same way, if you want to like, uh, for, for, for REST endpoints, if you would like to like map uh, parameter values, sometimes you have parameter values that are separated with commas, you'll usually do stuff like this. I want to parse that, I'll do a split by the comma, and then I have to add them to a list, and in the end I'll just return something. So in here again, I'll use an optional, and then do maps and do streams to uh, convert them to uppercase, and then collect them to a list. And if I don't have anything, then I'll just return a singleton list with a, with a default value. So, um, in here again, we don't have much difference between lines of code, but I just find it more and more readable this way as well. Now, the more interesting thing that I have for Jax OS is the use of um, completable futures uh, to do a sync calls. So, completable future is something that was introduced in Java. So we had futures on Java E7 or on Java SC7, and then we had completable futures on on Java SC8. Uh, SC8. For Java SE 8, uh, what we're able to do here is when we do uh, uh, an async call with my JAXRS endpoint uh, using the suspend annotation and I have an async response, I'm actually able to inject here now a manager executor service. So before Java uh, EE 7, there was no way, well, there was a way you were able to create your own threads, but those threads will be created. Uh, out of the scope of the application server, so you have to manage yourself, and it was something very dangerous for you to do, because it will lead to uh, some, uh, some leaks. Um, but with the management computer service, you actually will get the thread from the, from the container itself. Uh, so basically, that means that you're able to uh, supply an async to the completable future, handing over the executor of the Java, uh, of the Java server that you're running with, with this managed executor service, and then you can apply all these things uh, and, join and chain them together until you're happy with the response and, um, and accept whatever uh, thing you want. Notice here that I'm also using uh, streams and uh, streams, no, sorry, method references, so this could be changed to, uh, to Lambda, so if I'll just change it to a Lambda, this actually, the supply scene just takes a supplier so I can just uh, supply this method over here uh, as a method reference. And uh, the accept method, sorry, it's coming, oops. Um, the accept method is coming actually from the sync resume. When I want to uh, resume the, the, the JAXRS call, I can just call the sync response resume. It actually can also be converted to a method reference and um, uh, basically, these will, will, will all work together uh, in a very uh, interesting way. Okay, so JAXRS, uh, oh yeah, the thing that I wanted to show you a little uh, while ago uh, about combining optional. So sometimes people say that I abuse optional a little bit and maybe they're right. I just think that if uh, you're controlling your application and you're controlling your API, it's mostly okay. I just don't recommend for you guys to um, uh, to use optional as like an external API or a public API, so if it's going to turn into the app, I think it's fine. But let's just say I, I'm going to inject that movie bean over here. And uh, now I'm just gonna uh, do a new method, public response, find movie. This is a Jax RS response, this is a get. Uh, it might have a parameter, well, yeah, it should have a parameter. I'm just gonna not 
add the path parameter, so you'll assume that's there, it doesn't matter. And I can do like movie, find movie enhance dot if, and now I can do map um, response, oh, actually let's do it like, like the, with the lambda first, uh, response dot entity, uh, no sorry, response dot okay, I pass in the entity uh, from my movie, like this, and this can be converted now to a method reference, so basically you'll just wrap the movie in a response.ok object, and uh, if it's not present, I actually can do like a, a new, no sorry, a response.status, uh, and I say not found, and then build, and a return over here. Oh yeah, sorry, it's over there. Um, so once again, like I'll do my movie, find movie enhance, I'll do a map to response okay, or else I'll just do response status not found. You know, this can be a little bit improved by uh, doing static import over here, and doing static import of uh, this one over here. So this is where I find like, uh, a good usage of the, if you have an, an API that returns an optional as your data store, then you're able to do uh, like a, a chain in methods of like, if it's there, you just return a response okay, and if not there, you just return a not found, or you can just return whatever other response calls on your JAXRS uh, endpoint. Um, okay, so we've been to JPA, we've been to JAXRS. Um, Let's go to, I don't remember the order that I announced the things, but let's go to timer. I, li I like timer. Who here use timers? A few people, okay. I think you guys are gonna enjoy, uh, well, hope to, hope, hopefully the people that don't use them are gonna enjoy them as well. So here I have a timer, and I'm injecting the timer with annotation resource on my uh, AJB. And then I'm actually constructing here a timer. And usually when you're constructing the timer programmatically, you'll do something like, uh, uh, so you'll do like, you put the schedule expression over here, you pass in the, the config, and then on the method, that's the timeout, that's where you're gonna implement uh, the code, right? That's how you usually do it. So here I, I actually came up with an alternative approach, which is, um, storing uh, the, the method that I want to run as both a serializable and, as a, and a runnable on the, um, on this timer config um, um, uh, object, which allows you to pass in a serializable object, which is an info for the timer itself. Now the interesting thing over here is that I'm doing like a cast of like two objects, serializable and runnable, which is uh, super weird, right? Has, everyone, has anyone seen something like this before? Okay, a few people. So this is something uh, new in Java 8, so you were actually able to uh, cast, like uh, do an intersection of a cast of uh, two things, with a serializable and, and a runnable. So lambda's, lambda's expression of actually serializable stuff, so basically what I'm doing here is um, I create a method, uh, then on my info, I'll just call that method reference, since the lambda is serializable, and this is actually something that's runnable, I'll just cast them both to serializable and runnable, and then on my timer, uh, since I need a runnable, I'll just do a timer get info, cast it to a runnable, and then call run on, on that. So this seems to be super weird, but this actually works. Um, if you don't believe me, I'll try to run it. Um, let me see where I have this. Why, okay, let me, I'm, okay, timer being test. Uh, I don't think I, okay, there we go. that, uh, and timer bin is over here, so 
So the server should be booting up. And uh, yeah, I didn't want to run this on debug. But console, okay, now you see the output over there. Uh, wake me up, let me sleep, wake me up, let me sleep, and so on. So it's kind of like, so it's kind of like a, a hack around a timer, so you can actually pass in a method reference, uh, Java 8 method reference in inside of your timer and run it uh, directly over there. So like a way to combine Java 8 stuff. Um, let's terminate this, okay. 14 minutes. <laughs> so what else do I have? WebSockets, so who here uses WebSockets? One guy, you guys, oh sorry, two, three, four, okay. You guys don't like WebSockets? No. Well, it doesn't matter, I mean, the, the, what I'm gonna show here is mostly utility around the collections and enhancement stuff uh, around WebSockets. So when you, when you set up a, a WebSocket, you usually set up like a server endpoint annotation on your Pojo, and basically you have to implement those annotations, or not implement, but you have to annotate the methods with an open and close, so when you open a, a new session to the WebSocket server, or when you close the connection to WebSocket server, and basically, what I'm trying to do here is implement an RC um, st style of thing where uh, my endpoint will be chat and the uh, uh, slash channel name. So that will mean that uh, when I have a channel, I will have to create a, a, a new session for that, or I have the session I have to add it to, to that particular channel. So usually the old way, I will do something like, I'll get, I'll try to get the, the channels from my channel uh, hash map. If I don't have it there, I'll just create a new channel that's simulating the people joining a new channel. And then when I have the new channel, I'll just have the session joining that particular channel. So that basically will be something like uh, if there are no sessions or uh, I'll create the, the, the new key set for that and then I'll put, put the channel there and add it later. Now, with the enhancement stuff, I'll come just do something like, uh, they'll go to my channels, do compute if absent, and basically the compute if absent, what it's gonna do is, it's gonna run this, um, this lambda expression over here if uh, the channel is not there. So basically it will um, initiate uh, this uh, new key set and add it and uh, place it on that, that particular channel, and then afterwards I can call add on that so basically it will add the session uh, to that particular um, channel. So it's uh, just basically uh, this line of code is the same as, sorry, this line, this line of code is exactly the same as this over here, but this is using Java 8 style. So for the unclose, if something follows a, a simple, uh, similar approach, uh, I'll get the channel, if I don't have a channel, or if the channel is not null, I'll remove it. If, uh, if I don't find a uh, session in that channel, then I'll throw an illegal set exception. So in here, I'll, again, I'll use the optional, I'll try to get um, the, 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 the channels from, from the, my channels map, and if I don't get one, then I'll call on or else throw on my optional object, which basically will throw an illegal set exception and basically, if uh, everything goes right, in the end, I'll call dot remove. So again, uh, style of Java 8, instead of writing this, you can write something like, like that. Finally, when you have the on message method, uh, basically, I want to send a message to a particular channel, so my uh, WebSocket endpoint gets the session to send the, the message, has the message where, that you want to send, and to what channel should I send that message? So first of all, I'm just gonna process the, 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 the command that I sent to the, to the um, on the message, doesn't really matter, but basically what I'm doing here, I just have to grab the sessions that are on my channels, and if, there are, if the sessions are not null, I iterate on, on all the sessions, and if my session is not the same as I'm sending the channel with, then I'll send a message to all the sessions that I, it's not me. So basically it's just so, uh, kind of like when I'm writing into an IRC channel, so everyone else gets the, that particular message. So in the new way that you can do this, you can just 
uh, on the uh, channels map, you just uh, do a get or default, so basically this will uh, grab a channel, so we'll just do a collection, a collection on empty set, so this will mean that these things will not be um, evaluated if, of course, the, 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 the stream is empty. Uh, this is just like a small tip, uh, trick over here. Um, but anyway, I'll just call stream. Again, do a couple of filters to see if the session is open. Uh, and then I'll just uh, check if uh, it's not my session. And finally, I'll do for each of the sessions that I, I have, I'll just do an async remote and send the message over there. Uh, so these are a couple of examples of collect collection enhancements. So I apply these to WebSockets because uh, they they um, they have all these checks that you have to do. But of course they can be applied to any place that you will use collections uh, on your Java e-code. So we have nine minutes left. So let's see. Let me let me show you a couple of. Um, uh, crazy ideas that I come up with um, that may, that may I don't know if they will make it to the spec anytime soon, maybe they won't, but maybe, it's, uh, but those are basically ideas to improve um, Java E stuff with the Java 8 stuff. So bin validation, who here has used bin validation? Okay, a uh, few people. So for bin validation, uh, let's just see what I have over here. Okay, so bin validation usually have something called validator. You get the validator and try to validate stuff. That's the, the way it goes. So here you have a, a POJO, which has a not null um, annotation to validate if that uh, string name is not null. Uh, and then it has like a custom validation called license. So basically I have a driver here, and I'm trying to validate if the license is, uh, is okay. Um, and usually, when you want to, 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 to do this, you'll just inject the validator, you call validator.validate, and then you have to grab um, all, the, all the messages. In here, what I'm actually doing is I'm just uh, calling this as a stream, so this actually is still, this is still valid code. So basically, the validator returns you a set, and with the set, you'll be able to like stream it, you can map uh, the, um, the validations grabbing the constraint validation message, and then you can do this collectors.joining, which basically is gonna join uh, all the message uh, split by a comma into a single string, so you can send, the, send it to a, a web API, it doesn't matter, so you can see all the, all the messages over there. So just like a simple way to just have all, all the messages chained together. Um, but what, what, I, what I want to suggest is for the news API, what if, if we have a new method on the validator that will be something called an add constraint validator, which will accept an annotation, a class, and a predicate. So a predicate is something that was introduced, a functional interface that was introduced on Java 8, and basically the idea is that then on your bean, you will able to um, passing method references to do your validations. So basically here on uh, my, I will inject my enhanced validator, uh, and I can call this add constraint validator for my license, which is a, should be a string. Then I can pass this, this method reference, and uh, instead of just like uh, having to implement all that uh, um, validation, uh, custom validation interfaces, you'll be able to use them as a method reference directly, uh, so you're just passing whatever method reference you want to validate that particular field uh, or, or annotation, and you're done with that. This is this is not part of this of, uh, of uh, so this is something that I came up with. So this doesn't work. I just wrote the code to see how it will look like and uh, if it makes sense or not to, to maybe use it. So that's just an idea for for bin validation. Um, Batch. So batch, uh, I have a couple of crazy ideas here with batch. Who here uses uh, jbatch or batch? No one. Yeah, so probably I shouldn't talk about this, but <laughs> yeah, it's, I know batch is a pretty boring spec. Uh, I do love batch a lot because I uh, do a lot of batch stuff, so uh, I try to give it some love most of the times. 
Um, so in here, basically, on batch, you'll have an entity called an auction, uh, no big deal, and uh, I'm not sure if you guys, if you don't use it, I'm not sure if you guys are familiar with the spec, but we usually have something called a reader, a processor, and a writer that will basically read some data, will process some data, and then will write data back into something else. So in here, I'm just reading data from a CSV, uh, then I process it, so I just convert it to something else, and then the writer will just write this data uh, to, a, to a database. So read from CSV file, transform it, and um, put it back into a database. So th the idea that I have over here is actually, uh, what if, if we will make a, a, a batch of extends from a stream and add uh, methods on, on the stream that uh, compromise of batch stuff? So basically, that allows us to, to use the power of streams uh, directly with batch while adding uh, the stuff that we need from batch on the stream itself. So basically, I just extend the stream interface over here. I add a couple of methods um, that basically will tell me where to read the data and where, and where I'm going to write the data from. Uh, and basically, I hope that the... This, this doesn't work, of course. This is just like a, 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 some growth class that I wrote over here to see how this will look like. Uh, but maybe if we have like a batch that will write like, like this, maybe more people will use it. So instead of like having to write all the, the batch API, you'll just use a stream batch, or a, I'll call it like a batchable stream. Um, and basically this batch of, you'll just say, hey, I want to process 10 items at a time, calling in, uh, like this, this item count, I call a read on that uh, to, to, to read the data from, uh, from whatever uh, thing I have. Um, might be, so in this particular case, I'm reading data from a result set. Um, and in here, if you notice, I'm uh, this map, it's coming from, from, from this part over here. I do uh, map data, so this, this will be the, the, the equivalent to process. This will give it to write, uh, to, to read and white will be the equivalent of, of the, the writer of, of the batch. Um, but since this is a stream, then I will be able to do filtering, I will be able to uh, do counts, and well, maybe it doesn't make any sense because count is a, is a, um, a final method, or not final, but the, the, the final method you'll execute to get the, the result of the stream. Uh, but the idea here was to like combine the power of streams with, uh, with batch, so you'll have like a, You'll do like a, a batch of streams, and you'll be able to process your stuff uh, inside the stream, but as batch um, in uh, in batch sequence, like ten items at a time, twenty items at a time, uh, whatever items you want. Uh, I'm almost out of time, so uh, there are a couple of other things I would like to show you, but I think I've gone through the um, main ones. I just want to return here to the slides to talk a little bit of. Uh, a little uh, detail. So, uh, who here is familiar with parallel streams? Yeah, uh, a few, a few of you guys. So, parallel stream was something that was introduced on on, on um, Java C8 as well. Uh, so, this is like something that I, I, if you look into my code, I never use parallel stream ever uh, because. At the moment, no, there are no uh, way to support it on the Java E um, environment. So basically, that means that um, parallel streams they actually use the common fork join pool. Uh, so these threads live outside of the E environment. So if you start to use them, um, the fork corp, the fork join pools they sh they're going to use all your CPU cores. So basically, that will means that will they will starve your Java e applications of cores and threads. And uh, so that's a very, very dangerous thing. So basically, you'll have to use that at your, at your own risk. Um, if you really, if you, f if you come across with Java e code that is in parallel streams, you can use this um, um, property, which basically it will just use one thread on the four join pool, and basically there is no parallelism at all. But at least it will fix the code. Um, so hopefully in the future, AE servers will handle parallel streams properly. Maybe parallel stream will have a way to uh, send in um, your uh, thread pool of the application server, so it will use threads from the application server itself, 
and it won't, won't use strings outside of the of that scope. Uh, that well, basically, what I'm trying to say here is don't use them with the Java E uh, environment because it's not really safe. So I think that's pretty much done. I have 17 seconds left. So I'm uh, I'm up for some, some questions uh, if you guys have them. Uh, but anyway, let me thank you so much for for attending, and I was really happy to be here. So thank you so much for having me. Thank you.